the final round of Super Rugby Pacific. Educated, but no, oh, the ball, that's brilliant! <laughs> Got a ball away, Dolan Sessions, the first year Brewer, into second straight quarterfinals. And right up, he stabs it through the heart. Tēnā koutou katoa, good evening and welcome into the breakdown. While the Super Rugby playoff picture is clear, the Hurricanes are the top dogs, the one everyone is chasing over the next couple of weeks. The Crusaders, while they have missed out altogether in the Civil War, is it over in provincial rugby between the amateur and professional game or is it just getting started? These guys are going to add fuel to the fire in the last part of the programme, so you do not want to miss it, I tell you that. But right now we've got the Super Rugby Pacific Trophy in studio with us. Who's going to take this home this year? Well, Who's it's painted blue seat? already, isn't it? Is it blue for a reason? Well, they haven't won it so far, JK. I know, this is our year. <laughs> no one's won it. There's only one team that's won it. All we know is that they're not going to win it this year. And imagine saying that at the start of the season, that four New Zealand teams have made the playoffs and not the Crusaders. You let's, not talk, them, let's not talk about the start them. of the season. A lot of changes since then. I remember Mills yeah, when he picked the show one. Hey, oh, wait, wait, but he hasn't picked anyone all season, so <laughs> you don't count. You didn't pick anyone to hey, win my, the title. My, my team, both of the teams well, that I picked well, are, are in the quarterfinals, game? right? The who Chiefs and the Blues. They're both in the quarterfinals. Both of my teams. Both of my teams. Well, one of my teams is still in the fight as well. Don't forget about them. It is looking more like of a Highlanders colour there, actually, I must admit. Oh, I'm loving what you're saying. I'm yeah. loving what you're saying. Just for one more week, anyway. For one more week? OK. Well, people are saying the Chiefs are flying under the radar, but are you saying the Highlanders have been? Look, we got the result we wanted. We're going to Canberra <laughs> to play the Brumbies because we've known how much we've struggled. Are you being with... sarcastic? No, 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 I'm not. I, the fact that we've struggled against New Zealand sides. We really have. Even if you look on the weekend, you know, and when we played the Blues, uh, that we just, we've just struggled to get the job done. So for us to build momentum and to find a way to, I suppose, elevate our game, our best chance was to probably go and play the Brumbies. But it's a big ask because the Brumbies are good. They've played some good rugby. Um, it's going to be tough. But like I say, we're in a situation where we're going to have a new champion. Did anyone at the start of the season pick the Hurricanes to finish top spot? No. No, right. no. No. We, we, no. They, 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 They've they, been the big mover. Yeah, they did. They, I mean, I mean, after the first three or so rounds, and they were, I mean, we we're like far out. Let's, let's come on. Uh, one. We're talking about one minute. We're talking about one yeah. play being the difference. We're talking yeah, about a bonus point. The difference between, if I was to say the best team. It's are you not saying be... the Canes are the best team right now? Well, they've finished well, on top of the table, but there's nothing between them and the Blues. We're talking about a bonus point try at the end of a game in the last round, which is defined whether or not the Blues are top. Yeah. And if I was to look at the two teams, even statistically, yeah. and particularly look at the Blues' defence and what they've done over the course of this season, it's a shame it let them down in the last five minutes yeah. of the game last night at Eden Park. But I think they're going to be incredibly tough to beat. And I don't think we should take for granted that the Hurricanes are going to go through unbeaten from here or have a home final. We shouldn't take for granted the Blues are going to go through. There's going to be some challenges for those top two teams. Well, the, the day that I thought that the Canes might have been the real deal, I remember this really, really well because I brought a new hat <laughs> in Wellington, Kirsty, yes. and you were there. Was that when they you beat chose one, one back on the bench? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> right. And the Blues had a few injuries that night. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a bit of an interesting night, but the, the loose forwards for the Canes stood up, and I thought, wow, there's, there's something special here. There's a nice mix. The interesting thing about the Blues and the Hurricanes for me is the Blues have completely changed their DNA, right? Whereas the Hurricanes have kept their DNA. They've played way more expansive. When you think about the Blues, they've gone to the whole... Can I ask a question then? Does that style of football win titles? No. The Hurricanes? No. The Crusaders do, which is what the Blues are playing like, right, JK? Well, I wouldn't go that far, Kurt. They're on. playing a Blues New Balance style. <laughs> new Balance? Call it. <laughs> new Balance. Crusaders, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think, I think, you know, when you think about um, the progression of the Blues over the last few years, knocking on the door, being in finals, really disappointed, losing finals, stuff like that. Um, and Vern's brought this understanding of how you win tournaments like this. He's done it all around the world and he's brought this style of game that is really, really hard to beat. Whereas I think the Hurricanes, you know, they've found these loose forwards that are, you know, we're saying at the beginning of the season, yeah. who's going to replace Artie? 
Yep. You know, and all of a sudden we've got these young loose forwards that are playing incredibly well. TJ's come back in and just been outstanding. Um, and they've got something special going on. Does it win titles? Well, obviously, I hope not. I just, I mean, at the beginning of the year, I did not think that we'd get to the last four weeks and have this much excitement in terms of the ladder, everything else that was happening. But even last night, any other team, OK, any other team, you know, they were, they were dominated by the Blues. They would have just given up. But, you know, it, it got right down to that sort of bonus point and it made things interesting. The crowds have sort of come back. And so I just, I, I wouldn't have thought at the beginning of the season, you know, 15 or, or even, you know, uh, 12 rounds in, in that would have so much excitement in terms of this competition. Now it's now you know you're leading into that, and how great of a competition has it been? And the competition conversation changed half half time for the Rebels and Drill, right? The, the, yeah. You know it was a close game, close contest, and all of a sudden the Drill pulled away, scored their two or three quick tries, and you sort of knew that game was open, uh, gone. And then the conversation changed yeah. in a few hours. It changed from who was going to finish top. You know, I, I, look, I think the, the Hurricanes have done a fantastic job. Yeah. I really, really do. I really like where they've got to. I always thought this season would come down to how their 10 and 15 performed. Mm. And Cameron and Love have done a great job. They really, really have them driving that team and, and complemented by when you lose someone like Cam Roygaard, you're wondering whether or not you're going to have that, that type of influence at halfback. TJ has been fantastic. So they're right there. But what I'm saying is we're talking about the margins between those teams to me. There's not much. What about having Finlay Christie back for the Blues? Good to see him back out there at this time of the year. Yeah, um, huge for them. Uh, great to see him back out there. Um, after eight weeks on the sideline, I think he would have liked to have come off the bench, but they had to make a, a, a late change. And for his first game back to do that, put a, that the sort of shift, I thought it was pretty impressive, Mills. Almost a different spark to his game, right? You know, he, uh, the stuff that he, he sort of he started off when he was down at the muck or came back, sniped around the corner, but he's also you know, confident behind his forward pack as well. You know, the ability to pick up, have a little wee go, show a bit of confidence in it. He, he, he had a big shift considering he's been out for a very long time, but the confidence is starting to come back in him too. Oh, the thing I like, and we, we, always, you know, we always talked about Aaron Smith's pass, but the thing I like about Christie is he either passes or he takes a few steps to draw the defence in. Some halfbacks take that step and it takes up your time out the back, as you know, Mills, whereas Chris is very, very good at that. And once again, he showed last night that covering tackles that he makes, you know, he's also very good defensively. So, you know, I think, I think he comes straight back into the all-black conversation straight away. I think TJ's in there. And I think, like you always say, Goldie, you need a 9 and 10 that's in form. To, to get through. What the Blues are going to do this week will be an interesting discussion. Fascinating. Oh, and you're not going to give us any indication on which way they're going to go. You'll oh, just I leave think, it at that. Yeah, I think Perifetta goes back to fullback. Right. I think he goes back to fullback. Uh, it all comes down to... Uh, well, Rico's back. Ready to go. No, he, as long as he's ready to go. He's back. He'll be back. OK. It's, it's like, he loves game. the Blues, you know? <laughs> His mum will make him play. Like, it's pretty easy. <laughs> OK, there you go. Um, Seriously. <laughs> well, let's take a look at the quarterfinals then. This is the four matches you've got coming your way on your Sky Sport uh, and Sky Open screens this weekend. Chiefs taking on the Reds from Hamilton. We'll have a 45-minute build-up. We've got Tim Horan joining us from Australia. They're sending him over because they think that is the game that they can win this weekend in New Zealand anyway. The Hurricanes and Rebels kick off Super Saturday, 4 o'clock from Wellington, uh, followed by the Blues against the Fijian Drua and the Brumbies up against the Highlanders from Canberra. So you will not be switching off your TV screen until about midnight. Uh, but if you want to head along, well, you need to get on board quickly. The Hurricanes tickets go on sale on Monday at 5pm. If you're after tickets to the Chiefs, it is Tuesday 9am as well as the Blues. And there is a wonderful offer. You can take your kids along to the footy for just 10 bucks. How good. Well, someone who would be right amongst the $10 kids' tickets is former Wallaby and Stan Sport analyst Morgan Turunui. Morgan, you've got four children at home, so I know you'd absolutely get amongst that. Welcome into the breakdown. Great to have you joining us. Uh, four teams from either conference have made it through to the quarterfinals, but what does success look like for the Australian sides over the next three weeks? Uh, thanks for having me on. Gosh, gee, you work hard. Gee, they're, they're flogging you, aren't you? You're working right through the weekend, but thanks for having me. Yeah, oh, look, it's an interesting one. Of course, the Fiji and Drua did well to get in there. Excited to see what they can do the, for the Australian teams. We want the Brumbies to go deep, really. Um, there's some, the Rebels, it'll be tough for the Reds. Very quietly, there's some confidence in the Reds uh, camp that they might be able to do something special at Hamilton on Friday. But the Brumbies are the hope for the Australian people. I think, uh, especially if they can host first week, get over the Highlanders, and then who knows? They've come close the last couple of years. 
and Australian commentators and, and Brumbies fans are hoping they can go another step. I, I was, to, I was to, like, I've been rating the, the Reds all year, Morgs. Like, for me, Les Kiss has done an amazing job on creating a style of rugby that they enjoy and they seem to be really confident in that. But you're still saying the Brumbies are a way better side? You still think they, they're, they're a better chance? I think, as, as everyone there will know, home ground advantage means so much. How, how interesting was it that a, a bonus point, a losing bonus point, a winning bonus point, those sort of things, that we know how important they were for that Hurricanes Blues fight to come first because of home ground advantage. And that's why the Brumbies get, I think, more hope from Australian uh, supporters because we know how impressive they are in Canberra. The Reds... What they've shown this year is they can beat anyone on their day, can't they? They, they beat the Chiefs. They you know, took 82 minutes for the Blues to beat them and then lost in Golden Point in in them, but they're going to be on the road. If they're going to go very deep, if they're going to go all the way to the final game, it's three matches away from home, and it's rare that a team can do that. This is the reason I'm big on the Brumbies, Morks. Uh, the, I look at the way that they, they play the game. I think they're strong in the key areas when you come up against the New Zealand sides. And that's probably what the, the challenge that's in front of them, is whether or not they can st withstand the pressure up front. And I think they've done enough to do that, to show that. And they're dangerous in terms of their, I think, their leadership and game understanding mills on the insides. Lonergan and Lulaseal, to me, the combination, the, their game management, they've been able to uh, with, um, handle pressure. And if you get that first result, and I think the Hollanders definitely wanted this game. I, I won't <laughs> lie. We wanted, we wanted to go and play the Brumbies. Look, we're, we've beaten one side, right? Yeah. One New Zealand side in, I think, about three years. So all of a sudden, going there, the Highlanders will like their chances. They'll think that's their best opportunity to go deeper. But I've looked at the Brumbies all year, Mills. They've been, I think, the best and most consistent Australians. Oh, I think you're absolutely right. And they've always had been. Historically, they have been sort of really consistent. They've been in the finals. They've got great history. The, I think what I've loved about this year as well is their adaptability. You know, the, the ability to be able to, you know, uh, play that long kicking game, you know, strangle teams and force them to make mistakes, but also come back to, a, you know, flattening up. Laurel Seal has been a, a big influence in terms of um, that and understanding, I suppose, what Larkin has wanted. So they've, they've got a, a balance between you know, similarity between the way New Zealand teams play, but also, um, you know, they're, they're more than happy to play the, sort of their style and get the ball down there and, and using their big forwards as well at the same time. Can I just pick up uh, on something Morgan said about the Reds? They can beat anyone on their day. They come up against the Chiefs, who they've beaten twice in the last two years. Are the Chiefs starting to show speed wobbles at the wrong time of the season? JK, you question whether or not they've got the front row to compete in this competition. They're going to get put under serious pressure this weekend, aren't they? Yeah, and, and Morgs, it would be really good to get your opinion from across the ditch about the New Zealand size as well. But um, for me, I just don't think that the uh, Chiefs type five right now uh, are going to be able to go deep into the competition. I thought they, they rattled a wee bit, um, you know, against the Blues last night, who have a very, very good pack, but also a bench that can come on. No Tupo Vai, though. Yeah. Uh, Tupo Vai is a massive part of the Chiefs in terms of their ability up front to be more competitive and, and certainly helps, I think, the front row. I mean, when I look at the Chiefs, I don't think they've played their best rugby, right? I think everyone can accept that. Yeah, and Tupo Vai also is a big, you know, like, for me, that's important. But you saw the, well, you saw the Blues have an off night in the scrum against the Crusaders and got beaten. The Chiefs came to Eden Park and they got pumped up front. Tokoyahu came on and maybe improved that, but I just don't think at this level, if you don't have a bench coming on, you look at the Blues bench, you look at some of these other teams with their benches, they've got guys coming off the bench that are really, really competitive. I don't know what you're seeing from across the ditch there, Morgs, but um, are you seeing that from New Zealand sides like the Chiefs? Yeah, well, it's an interesting one. Where, you know, yeah, it's a pretty good last couple of games that they played the Chiefs, but it's, of course, against the, the teams right at the top of the table. So it's not quite the wobbles from the way that I'm looking at it, but it is telling where they've come up short. And when I analysed the, the Blues-Chiefs game today, I looked at the way the Blues attacked the Chiefs and they wanted to go straight through their heart, didn't they? And it worked. It worked to great effect. The Hurricanes did something similar. The Reds are a different proposition if you want to talk about them. They play probably the most similar style of rugby uh, to anyone in Australia, to the Chiefs. 
The Reds want to put speed in the game at the breakdown and they want to make you pay out wide. And that's what the Chiefs did. You look at uh, the, say, the back five for the Blues. They had the starting back five for the Blues, so from a numbers 11 to 15, missed 11 tackles on the weekend. But the Chiefs couldn't stay in the fight up front from the Blues. And that's why I think people like Mills and I who chat most Wednesdays, we've warmed to the Blues right through the year because they've been so tough up front. You can win ugly. And in, in finals footy at home, we're not sure what the weather will do. Sometimes you're not going to be able to play the fast, expansive game that many teams will want to if they can. A team like the Blues, they've been able to play tough. Chiefs and Reds, they haven't been able to do that week to week. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good point. And, and, and you're right. And I think, I mean, I know we talk about the forwards and they will set a sort of big platform. And one thing I, I would like to ask you most, particularly with the, I mean, we talk about the Brumbies, they're pretty settled, right? In the in 19 combination, Lord Lucille's been heavily involved. But when you look at the other two, you know, Gordon, Straw, and they've sort of mixed it up, Liner, Crichton with, with the Reds. When you're going into finals football, and is that a good thing for, for, for those teams? It's almost a, sort of a, a, a surprise. Or could it be sort of a hindrance for them that there's no consistency in terms of, um, you know, their driver around, around the park, particularly in these big moments? It's a theme right across 2024, isn't it, that the good teams have been able to turn over and change their team list week in, week out and still win. Hurricanes have done it better than anyone else. Uh, I think for the Brumbies, it's a definite advantage. Ryan Lonergan and Noah Lewis, CEO, they played the last block. So when I look at the Brumbies, I've split their season. I thought they were OK early. They were found wanting very early a couple of times, especially in Super Round. But the, funnily enough, ironically, the marquee victory and what really kick-started their season was their win excellent. They'll look to try and get James Slipper back this week. And apart from that, that's a really settled team. Nine and ten are good. Al Lato has had some minutes up front where it will be important. The starting back line from the weekend against the force, that should be the starting back line, their best back line this weekend. Nine and ten know each other. It's a settled Brumbies team. I definitely think that is the advantage. Carter Gordon, of course, for the Rebels, was a late scratching over in Fiji. He is so important to everything they do. One, because even at training month, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, he's the one doing all the reps. He's the one with the combination with Andrew Kellaway. He's the voice that the team are used to. Throwing other people in there, that's hard for the Rebels. The Reds, on the other hand, they've been able to, to change to and fro, especially recently with Crichton and Tom Liner. Tom Liner is probably their most trusted, accomplished number 10 at the moment. you probably see him start alongside Tate McDermott this week. Want to change tax a wee bit, Morgs. Obviously, really, really sad news, um, you know, about the Rebels... Uh, you know, I feel very sorry from a psychological point of view for the players that are losing contracts and staff and all that sort of stuff. But what the hell happened, mate? Like, I've heard there was, there's $8 million of debt. Um, you know, you just can't afford it. I think from this side of the Tasman, we've been saying, you know, you should have dropped down to less franchises a while ago. You probably got rid of the wrong franchise. But what has happened there? Is it just, like, financial misconduct? What's going on? Well, it's very interesting, depending on which side of the fight you're on, JK. Uh, the, the reality of the situation, the specifics are in January, uh, the Rebels went into voluntary administration. They couldn't be considered a going concern. And what has been revealed is in some of their books, they've got a, a significant... There's, there's different numbers being thrown about, but something like an $11 million Australian tax office debt that needs to be paid. Uh, in terms of the $8 million shortfall in their budget, that's for some of the sort of high-performance money that traditionally Rugby Australia has given to each Super Rugby team. Since COVID, it's a little under $2 million a year. Since COVID, Rugby Australia hasn't been in a position to give that. So there's there's a lot of debt that's been accrued and a lot of overspend within the Rebels. I think everyone is agreeing to that. And it's a long story. And, and, and you know, the, the first thing is, of course, feeling for the players and staff that have actually had one of the Rebels' greatest ever seasons. But but uh, the last sort of decade, they've gone further and further into debt. Their crowds haven't improved. On-field success has escaped them. And all those things have come together to, to show that, that them themselves as a Super Rugby franchise hasn't been working. And, and it gets to that larger question that you mentioned, JK, what's the right amount of teams for an Australian market as 
you know, NRL, AFL, they've gone through the roof with their national, domestic, tribally-based competitions, whereas rugby has always been... Unfortunately, because we play you guys so much, you can... You know, if you're, if you're the NRL, someone in your competition is winning every year. The Roosters will win one year, the Panthers will win another year, someone in your group's happy. If you're playing in an across-border competition, as we found, and especially against you guys, you don't win that often sometimes. So the, all those things have come together. The issue in Australia is... Are more teams important for the health of the game to inspire young kids or should we go to less teams to help Wallaby performance and then perhaps to grow the game as opposed to having expansion? That's the massive question that no-one has ever really uh, had real clarity on in Australia. Now we've been forced to go from five to four. It may be that we've been forced to do something that will help the game in the future. There is a fear that, one... You know, there's 19 international footballers come out of the Melbourne market, a great super rugby team. Will that pathway be lost and less kids be playing rugby in Victoria and want to play for the Wallabies? These are all questions that Phil War and Dan Herbert are in charge of Rugby Australia are trying to answer while also being fiscally responsible in a really tough time for Australian rugby. If we talk about the competition as a whole then, Morgan, what do you think of 11 teams? Is 11 teams in a competition enough? Well, I think it is, actually. I think we could end up... You know, 10 might even be the magic number, maybe 11. It depends what you guys want to do on your side as well and get to home and away. Whether we're right about is it is it more content required or is it is it is it like the old days where it was Super 12 and it's just a sprint first past the post? So I don't mind, say, 10 perhaps, but it's whether we go to different markets too. Do we go back to Japan? It didn't work last time. Third biggest economy in the world. There's got to be some sort of presence in the Pacific region. Is provincial rugby a good thing for Japan? Uh, I'd be happy to find a 10-team comp and I'm happy to cop 11 with a buy next year just to see what it might look for, look like. Uh, a lot of it really is, well, there's an Australian point of view, then we need your guys' point of view, what's right for our region as well. Well, you've given our team a lot to discuss on the breakdown for the next 10 minutes. Thank you so much for joining us on the program, Morgan. Always appreciate your time uh, and enjoy this weekend. Thanks, Drew. Hopefully there's a few Aussie teams left next week. <laughs> <laughs> what is uh, right with our region? We can't even sort our country out. But anyway, we're going to talk about that later. <laughs> He's really stirred the I've, pot, hasn't he? Well, Australia have right. dropped a team. Do New Zealand need to do no, the same? He's what, asking what to do with he, this is region. He, is he suggesting that we drop the Crusaders this year? What's, <laughs> what, what's he talking about? Hey, How do you short? get it down no. to 10 teams? You and don't. What, what do you do with the competition, um, then, JK? What's the this, idea? This is, this is what I think we should suggest. We play um, 11 games, right? Biannually, home and away. So, 10 games. So, so 10 games. Yep. 20 games. Biannually, no, no. Oh. Biannually, home and away. So one round. You play a semi-final and a final, but you don't play it until we break into our region. Then we play a um, Heineken Cup, Steinlake Cup, whatever you want to call it. Bring Japan in, bring America in. So play that, play that for, for six weeks. What happened next yeah, year? Yeah, no, because we can't get around our governance to make quick decisions. Don't, but let's not go, go there. there. Don't go there yet. Let's don't go there yet. So <laughs> then we create another <laughs> tournament. Not to go there yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we create another tournament and then we play the finals of that. I like that idea, the, JK. It was the season. I definitely think, I mean, 11 would, would be would be OK with me, you know, sort of um, one round, maybe home and away every second, well, you know, depending on where you sort of play, 11 rounds and then probably go to a top six. Yeah, how many know? teams is the question? When you've only got 11, what's the playoff system? Well, the playoff system, you get to that, and um, top six, um, and then the top two teams have a, have a break and the other two sort of play it off for, uh, for a semi-final spot. Mm. But I, there's, I, I think there's no doubt in my mind, and we've discussed this before, this is, is, is probably a good thing for Australian rugby. It's going to strengthen um, the other four sides. It's gotten to this point. It's unfortunate it's gotten to this point that they've sort of basically had to sort of um, colour team. But I think in the long run, in terms of the competition, it might possibly make it a lot better. Uh, this is not unfortunate. This was just necessary. Uh, the amount of pressure that Australian rugby is under financially, they obviously had to make a, a critical decision around that. Uh, in terms of their player depth, it's something they've struggled with for a yeah. long time now. Mm -hmm. In terms of competitiveness, you add those players and spread them out across, or I'm pretty sure the Waratahs will be in for some players. I think the force will be financially in a position because they've got plenty of backing over there. I think it won't hurt them in any way, shape or form. Um, I think the Wallabies will be better for it. Uh, I, just, I just look at it across the board and go, I... I 
It's, don't get me wrong. I'm sad for those players who have yeah. committed themselves to the Rebels. And, yeah. you know, I, I think the um, Victorian government in particular had really supported them and, you know, uh, given them every opportunity. It just hasn't taken yeah. in a marketplace which is really, really hard. Uh, Australian rugby's had to make some really difficult decisions. In terms of what you talk about, I think you're right. Um, is there enough games, though, if you've only got 10... Yeah. Games. That's only five home games in a season. You talk to any um, Super Rugby CEO, that's not enough to sell to sponsors, to sell to the fans in terms of a package. One and a half rounds for me if you're talking 15 uh, in some way, shape or form. Yeah. At least you get seven not, or eight home games. I'm just saying, you know, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I saying, like your Heineken Cup idea. Yeah. I've always liked that. But I think in terms of think top six now. makes sense. Yeah. All of those things work. I, I'm with Morgs on this. Let's play it out for a year and see how it looks. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think I just want to talk about um, who was responsible for the dumbest decision ever to get rid of the force when they had a billionaire behind them to keep the rebels. You can't tell me an eight or nine million or 12 million, whatever it is, debt comes that quickly, right? So they got rid of the wrong franchise. So that is actually a, a strategic mistake. And the thing is with our game now in the professional era, it, it's so much more complicated to make those decisions. I think if you have the right competition and you're filling stadiums, the sponsors will come. You can't go the other way around, Goldie. You can't say, oh, if we do this, it's hard to sell. It, everything's easy to sell if the product's good. And the product's been great this year, right? And the crowds are starting to turn back up. Why? Because the product's good. Regardless of what our world rugby wouldn't change the rules. Uh, in, our, New Zealand, in New Zealand, has. But I, in I, New Zealand, I think if you look at the crowds across in Australia, they're nowhere near yeah. as. But the as product the in product's Australia, not as good. The product in Australia needs to change in terms of success. They need to come over here and win Hence and the, win finals. They're like Morgs is saying, yeah. and this is what's going to create that. Well, you we'll know, find having, out next year exactly whether or not that's they've got that little bit closer. I'm not sure if you can tell, but there's a bit of edge about the show tonight, and that's because all of them cannot wait to rip into the governance review papers. in part three. We will get to that, but still to come, we talk about what could have been for the Crusaders in 2024. Oh, how good. So how, how many sprints have you done down to the IRB? None. None? Is it pretty mellow? Doesn't need a show. You have a show though, don't you? Like not a television. Not anymore. Not anymore. No. Is it finished now? Yeah. Was that one and done? Yeah, I think they got they got us in the wrong week last year, so we're here for about a week and nothing happened. Mm. And then the week where they left, everything happened. You're a bit of Bondi surf action. Oh, awesome. Yeah, of course. Where are you from? Germany. Are hey, you German? Yes. Mm. Good on you. German surf. You want to yes. Yes. Scott Razor Robertson has the most amazing way of connecting with people. I cannot wait to watch that three-part series, and that is coming to your screens uh, later this month. But for the first time in seven years, uh, he will not be break dancing, and the Crusaders will not be hoisting this trophy up. Now, the Crusaders CEO Colin Mansbridge has come out today, and they are undertaking their own external review on the season that has gone horribly wrong for the Crusaders. They finished ninth out of 12 teams and they won four of their 14 games at the start of the season no one thought that this was going to happen JK so while they're doing their own review we're going to do a breakdown review on their season I'm not worried at all about the Crusaders I, I, I think it would have been arrogant of anyone to think of the amount of people that they lost including their coach to think that they were going to have a season Put that in with Cody Taylor going, um, you know, injuries to their best player in and out for a season. But they've got, they've, they have been the envy of all of the other franchise for a long, long time with their development system. They'll be fine next year, but like it was, for me, it was not a bad thing to happen. Like, you, you know, it won't be bad for them to, to face the adversity that most of us have faced. They just haven't faced it for 20 years. <laughs> So are you calling me arrogant for picking them to win the title? Is that yeah, what you're saying? Totally. Oh, yeah, that, that, is that, is that, yeah, totally. You were yeah. just slipping it in there. Yeah, you were just yeah. slipping it in there. I wasn't, was arrogant I wasn't actually of, naming like, you, but I was referring me. to you. Yeah, look, I look, think... No one saw this playing out the way it played out, particularly no. on in the competition. Um, look, there's no doubt they'd lost some influential players. I was looking at some guys maybe being fit and healthy for a significant part of the season. So when you lose a Fergus Burke for the majority of the year, they're starting first 5-8 to replace Richie Moonga. 
That's really difficult. Then Scott Barrett picks up an injury. Tamaiti Williams goes, loses yeah. his hamstring in the very first, first game. Cody Taylor doesn't come back until the last month. Yeah. And all of these important pieces of the puzzle led to the fact that they've ultimately missed out by one performance. Yeah. Probably would have been enough. One more win. But there were some things along the way, Mills, that ultimately weren't good enough. Um, given the sort of thing that they've done in the past, the way they've played in the past, the composure they've shown, a lot of those guys had been there and done that before and they weren't able to get it done against teams that you would expect them to still be able to go out and, and beat. The, the one thing I'll ask you is that we love a review in this country. Why can't they do an internal review? Considering they would have done an internal review when they've won all those titles. So they should know the Crusaders... That's in the next section, mate. Well, no, 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 but what I'm saying is it, but they should know their, their environment inside and out. It wasn't just one man. He was a big part it's of it. It's employment law, I think, mate. Well, no, if what... you're going to sack someone, I've been there, right? So I resigned... I resigned an hour before they would have sacked me. So they do the review, and you can either wait for that to come out, or you... Resign, so this is or the CEO is, is makes this a their decision. excuse to be able well, to get rid of Rob Penny, or is it that the, they, they can't ask, it, ask it's, the hard it's questions? It's stalling for time. But I, as I, you just I, said, the Crusaders will be a different team next year when they've got Will Jordan uh, and Cody Taylor and all of yeah, these guys back from the start of the season. Yeah. It won't be the same team that he's I working think, with. Uh, like a, this is why it's really topical, because we're, we're not talking about any team, right? Yeah. We're talking about the Crusaders. You know, the most successful Super Rugby franchise, possibly even the professional franchise you know, in New Zealand or, or globally, but they have standards, right? And, they, and, and they've obviously worked out the fact, hey, we'll get to the end, and a lot of things happen along the way. They lost key players, but it also then they lost another person that wasn't you know, filling that role. David Harvilli was, was you not. Know, you talk about um, Fergus Spirit coming back, then they had the youngsters come in. So obviously you feel for Rob Penny because you have plans of some of that sort of happened, but they all kind of happen at the same time. And then when you're trying to find um, results, mm. meaning success, they just couldn't get into a rhythm. But they are still a quality side. I think the review is more so, I mean, if anything, the positive is they've now gone through this. Yeah. They haven't gone through this stuff. Like the Blues have done it for how many years? Probably Chiefs the same the same time. Um, mm. Hurricanes probably don't get it as much. But for the very very first time, the Crusaders have got a bit of stick. And the way they sort of dealt with they'll it, they'll probably I think come back and win. It'll be more year. what they'll be looking at. I'll ask the question. You were down there for their awards dinner, yeah. right? What was the vibe like down there inside that room? Given all the challenges, given the the, the quality of the players they were honouring, was. Was there a fear or a disappointment or just an understanding that what they've gone through this season is something they didn't expect? There wasn't or... a whole lot of chat about the current group. It was all about the players that came through in the yeah. 90s and the early 2000s. But I think there was a feeling that day against the Blues that they weren't ever going to lose that game. If they had a couple of extra games in this season, I think we all know they would have made the playoffs. And there's another question I wanted to put to you, because right now they would normally prepare, be preparing for the playoffs. So their All Blacks are coming in, having played hard in games. What happens to these All Blacks now that are going to be starters? You talk about Cody Taylor. You talk about, um, about Scott Barrett, potentially Ethan Blackadder. What happens to these guys? There's still five weeks that they'll have no rugby before England. Well, I'm really old. Kirsty, so I ha I've got to change my mentality, to be fair. I said that to Mills just before. So, I mean, Finlay Christie comes in after 10 weeks off and plays a blinder, you know? Cody Taylor comes in, plays 50 minutes. I don't think that stuff matters anymore. I mean, we're always resting our All Blacks. I think Razor will go, good, take the rest, keep your training up, and you'll be fine. I don't think might he start someone off the bench or someone who's been playing, but it's actually not a bad thing. I don't think we can think like that anymore. They can just go straight into this. I mean, Richie McCaw, what did he take? Seven weeks off and then play the World Cup, you know, with a broken foot. So these guys at that level, if they're good enough and they've got the experience like Cody Taylor, he won't be worrying about it, I think. I mean, he'll give as much time as he can to Scott Barrett, get his back right. So I think that mentality, I've got to change my mentality because I'm going, well, is he going so to last a return to club? No, return to play now is a lot more sophisticated than what it was. You know, I mean, you're talking about just a handful of guys, but you've still got Blackhead that's come back in. Old Moore came back in in the weekend, looked like he hadn't missed a beat. I think now they've obviously got a reset. They have this five weeks there that those guys that are going to go possibly make it, that, um, you know, they'll have to reset and, and make sure they come back. I don't have any issues with that. I think you're right. You know, we've, we've moved on to a, a different sort of generation and they come back and that, they're hissing. I'll just say one thing. I hope the Crusaders don't overreact to what's happened this year. They yeah, take the time yeah. to understand that they've still got a, a quality squad that's going to be competitive next year. In terms of the players, though, 
um, if they want to go and play a game of club rugby, put up your hand and go and play a game of club rugby. Yeah, how good. I would just say that. You know, if, if you've already Ethan Blackout and you go, is it all right if I go and play? If he wants to go and play, yeah. he should play. Don't be told he can't play. No, no, if perfect. He wants to go and play, and he goes, "Look, I need a game." But I it's want not going to prepare him for. for no, no, it's not going to prepare him. But he might. No, it's no, only going to put him at risk. Yeah, but, but I agree. Go but, and play. But if he wants to play, you should never stop a guy who Especially wants to play. Especially if they play for Marist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it always comes with a caveat with Sir John Kerwin. Yeah, absolutely. Next, you'll be trying to sign him for the Blues <laughs> next year. Uh, Righto, we've been talking about Cody Taylor, who's uh, one of the bright spots for the Crusaders in the last few weeks. Uh, and your moments this week, Mills, what are they? Well, they're going to be the rampaging. Hookers, you know, I thought Ooh. I'd have a look at some some of the hookers, especially also you talk about Cody Taylor, but also Asafa Omoa uh, returning back. So the first one for me really is himself. This is a wee bit in the early days when he was playing for Wellington, first on the scene. Um, and when you're seeing a hooker do stuff like this um, and the speed that he had with it, JK. Did he, did he make it as an apprentice that yes. year on yeah, the All Black? Yeah. Was he the first apprentice? No, I think Artie Artie Sabia Sabia was his first apprentice. Yeah. yeah, but not only, I mean, he was pretty good, but, you know, you've got to do it also at international level. And one man that definitely did that showed plenty of speed, Stan Coles. And you'll never forget this moment. Look at that. A little wee out there, heads out. You talk about old school? Old school hooker. <laughs> old school hooker. Yes, he might have been able to do this, but look, look, he ain't no physical beast. <laughs> but I tell you what, a competitor. Yeah, I mean, he's what he... When I talked about guys redefining the position, he redefined the position. Yeah, and I'd probably re rewind a little bit earlier then. I think Kevy was probably yep. one of the first to be able to do it. Kevin Mialamu, he was exceptional, especially around those close quarters. Big thighs for a big man. And, gee, look at that. Was that from the 22? <laughs> the rumour was he was the guy that you least wanted to get in the octagon with. Was that, was yeah, that the rumour went around? Yeah, he was the he, guy, he right? He the box. Yeah, and he was technically very sound and he hit pretty hard. <laughs> Octagon, isn't that the Not Dunedin. the Dunedin oh, Octagon, sorry. I'm talking about the, yeah. the MMA, no, no, MMA he one. Want to go down. He would not see <laughs> oh, down the Dunedin there. Octagon. <laughs> but <laughs> the thing, the thing <laughs> is about Kevy, great lessons for other young people that are watching. Got told he was too small, oh. got told he should stay loose forward, yeah. you know, went to, the, went to the Chiefs for a season and just got really determined and changed oh. the game, Mills. Yeah, exactly. No, he was, was a good man. And it was probably me there they mistaken Kevy for, because I often get mistaken <laughs> for Kevy Mill, I'm and Molina. So I was probably the one at the, at the octa then. Uh, <laughs> <Dunedin. So laughs> I'll own up to that right now. OK, the next one. <laughs> Malcolm Marks. Malcolm Marks. I mean, oh. we all love the South Africans, but this guy here, he brought a bit of force. Um, he definitely, you know, I still remember the game in Albany. We didn't quite hit the darts right. And then the following week, uh, they went over to South Africa, and he produced stuff like this. I mean, look at, the, look at those shoulders. Jeepers. Damn. <laughs> and I've got to go back to your days, JK, because it wasn't so much in terms of explosive, but he almost took your wing position. That's Sean Fitzpatrick. I mean, how, how do you get a hooker out there back then? Like, yeah, actually, I'll much? tell you a funny story. He cost me my old black jersey, old Fitzy. Like, Laurie rang me and dropped me and said, you don't score tries anymore. And I said, because that's because bloody Fitzy's outside me all the time. Look at that, there he is all the time. <laughs> Mate, try you assist. Know. That's a great offload, JK. <laughs> Yeah, good drop. Got a drop for you, Goldie. Anyway, he won't go there. But Fitzy, <laughs> Fitzy was the beginning, wasn't he, Goldie? He was the beginning of that play a bit looser. You know, he had the tight game, but he also loved getting out wide and just, uh, well, just a great and a great leader. Well, you think about you know when the game changed from amateur to professionalism, and all of a sudden we started playing at a different speed, right? So he was probably halfway through his career as an All Black, and so the second half of his career, like you saw there, was actually playing on the edge and having to be fitter, faster, more athletic, and he was able to do that, you know. And uh, you can't underestimate. He like I, he, he was a great All Black captain. Yeah, and I suppose you can't go away without filling a bit of a rivalry that they sort of had together. They were a different specimen back then, those hookers. So I went for Phil Kearns. Uh, not for his explosiveness, but maybe the explosive stuff that came out of his mouth after this. <laughs> <laughs> and who was that to? Fitzy. <laughs> that, was a, that, was a, that was the longest carry of his career. Um, I would, August, uh, Augustine Creevy's one, though, as well. Um, for Argentina, he had a couple of years where he was unstoppable, the bull, uh, playing for the, yeah. for the Pumas. Uh, outstanding. Mm, well, speaking of fiery and athletic hookers, let's take a look at the current crops, the ones that are in the conversation for the All Black squad that will be named on the breakdown special straight after uh, the Monday after the Super Rugby final. Here's the names that we've got down on the sheet. Ricky Riccatelli, Samasoni Tokiaho, Asafo Almoa, and just look at his stats. In five games, 6.2 metres uh, per carry and 96 
50% tackle completion. Cody Taylor, we know what he's done over the last month. George Bell was in the All Blacks conversation last year, we mustn't forget. Who's the most fiery out of these? Who's the new Dane Coles that's also got the mouth on it? <laughs> you need that, don't you? Oh, I know who it is. How Cody is Taylor. A hundred percent. If you see how competitive he is yeah. and leading this Crusaders when he came back, um, there's a fire in his belly to the point where he almost, he sees red mists a little so often. But I'm, I'm uh, look, I think Cody's a, a lay down. This is the guy who's yeah. he's he's number the number one, one hooker. Yeah. Um, look, he's came back. He had a fantastic season last year. Uh, it's, it's great to see him come back, clearly refreshed and playing well, Mills. Yeah, 100%. And I, and I know his leadership qualities has been discussed. You know, he, he, he brings that too. He's very much a leader. I like the way he's come back. He's, he's fresh. Um, you know, what he sort of adds is presence also, especially with this, this new sort of lock sort of coming through. Mm. Um, you know, he's going to be invaluable for the All Blacks. And JK, you've slipped in a Blues player here, Ricky Riccatelli. Maybe a surprise for some, but he's impressed you this year? Yeah, look, he has. I think he's, he's this game that, that the Blues are playing have really suited him. I mean, his yardage won't be too big because he's at the back of the mall there. Um, tackle completion's really good. I, I, I think really what we're looking at is probably Cody... Asafo and Samasoni. Samasoni's probably had a season. I wouldn't let you down. Sometimes you need a guy who won't let you yeah, down. Yeah, I agree and with that. And that's what Ricky Riccatelli has done I agree this with year. That. I think that the person under the most pressure is Samasoni. You know, outstanding for a couple of years. Um, hasn't been making the starting lineup a wee bit. Like, looks like he's just having one of those flat seasons. But like, some players have in their second or third season. Can I ask so, you a question though around how teams use players? Yeah. And the Hurricanes use Asafa Amua. Quite, quite a bit out on the edges. So all of a sudden, he's in a situation where he's the second last carrier or he's getting it with an opportunity to carry. Sometimes they can be a little bit misleading, a 6.2 minute carry. Well, it's not all done through the middle of the park with them. He's got an ability to get it out on the edge. And we saw you know, in Mills' moments, his ability to gas it. And this is the sort of thing that he's got a skill set, he's explosive. Um, the question marks will be around. Can I? You have to hit your spots at line out. Yeah. Can Can I just ask? Can I just put something out there? Let's just pretend that I know something about this, which is an absolute lie. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that Jason Ryan will be looking at two things first: your scrumming ability and your ability to throw the dart. After that, everything would be a bit of a bonus if you can bring all those things like Cody Taylor. You're in. But I think with Asafa Moore, he needs to really sort his darts under pressure. I think Samasone is not... The, I mean, we know Samasone now. If you're marking him, you, you're going to get a hit on. So he's not making those breaks that he used to before. Mm. So it'll come down to scrums. Who's the best scrummager and who's the best thrower of darts, right? To to darts we're, we're not talking about literally darts. Out, yeah, we're talking about line out throws. throws. We're talking about darts. Throws. We're talking about line out throws. I mean, I know that. But I, I look Sam at that. That's Samasoni Tokiaho, though, JK. 93% line out accuracy. So you say he's having a quiet season. He's the best at throwing them. Who, who am I talking about? Samasoni. His line out yeah, accuracy. Samasoni. That's what I'm saying. I'm saying, like, if you look at a Safo or more, if you look at his line out accuracy, it's at 84. So if you're a forward coach, what are you looking at? You're going, well, okay. Um, we know a suffer, but Ricky's only at 88. It's close enough. You know, you're looking at Cody at 87, 93. I would say the All Blacks would be looking for somewhere around the 90s like they would in a well, kicker, wouldn't absolutely. they? Absolutely. No doubt about that. Uh, the one thing I would say is, though, when Tyrell Lomax and Asafa Amu were, were together mm. for the Hurricanes forward pack, their scrum was on fire. Yeah. So I, I think maybe he's made some steps up there, but you're 100% right. I mean, Listen, I, Ryan will be looking at a number of things. I love, I love that list. What, the, the best thing I love about that list is the variety. Mm. The, the variety in terms of what they can actually add. Yes, you've got to get the set piece right. Right, but you know, somebody Sawney brings something to another power game. I'll more a little bit wider. Cody Taylor brings a little bit of both. I love the sort of uh, the options they've sort of got there in, ter in terms of picking those well, pro possibly three three hookers. Mm. Say no more. And George Bell, not part of the conversation at this point after the season the Crusaders have had, even though he was a part of it last year. Surely I it's someone that they've headhunted for future honours. Yeah, look, so sometimes, like, with the dark arts and all that sort of stuff, you know, someone like him would get in and because Jason Ryan would say, well, he does this, yeah. it, you know, he puts pressure on the tight head or something random like There's that. There's a you big future saying? for this kid. Yeah, yeah really totally. is. What's the, I mean, the, the, yeah. The, you know, right now, um, does he look as though he's ready for that next step up? Even physically, I'm not 100% sure, you know, in terms of... You know, straight size. Once again, there's an athleticism. We saw what yeah. Dane Coles does, but I still like the kid. Yeah. I love what he plays. I'm just at the moment, I think there's probably uh, in the position some guys who are just a little bit more of a, a, a experienced than being there and done that. But 
you say, that's Pretty a great list stock, for us say. to have. The stock. dumbest thing they did in rugby, mate, was they got rid of wingers that throwing the ball. That is the best it, thing they oh, ever oh, oh, That was awesome. That You're bringing Grant Batty. Oh. I love that man. Oh, oh, I love that man. A year before I started playing, they took the old... <laughs> so, he, he can do it. <laughs> oh, we have oh, yeah. Bring it back, mate. The French do it occasionally. Let's get, let's get out of this conversation as fast as we can. Okay, he's going to go home and uh, throw some darts, but it is time, gentlemen. It is time to rip the band aid off. Get ready. Uh, we're taking a quick break here. We'll be back on the breakdown right after this with everything you want to hear on the vote. No, my hockey, my welcome back into the breakdown. While the fire has well and truly been lit between the amateur and the professional game, we've been talking about the governance review. JK, do you want to jump in? No, I've got to stop you straight away. What? It's, it's actually about the professional and the professional game because the amateur, PUs okay. are professional. Let's leave the let's leave okay. the, the clubs and the amateur game out of this because they're the ones that are going to suffer the most. Just remember, the PUs are professional. Righto, Thursday. The First special... confusion. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> this, we're going to get really confused if we keep doing this, but the special general meeting happened on Thursday and uh, the powers that be voted on Proposal 2. Let me just remind you of two things. If Proposal 2 was to go through, the chairperson of New Zealand Rugby, Dame Patsy Reddy, said she would stand down, she would resign. And also, the head of the Rugby Players Association said the players, the professional players, would go at it alone if this happened. So, Jeff, talk us through right. what happens next. Your Here we go. Your Here I go. Explain, All right, so this is taking the proposal two. I have printed off the New Zealand rugby website. So this is 100%. Proposal two. Exactly. Proposal two. All right. So what they're doing now is they've got to establish a governance advisory panel. That's seven members. So what it is is someone from the New Zealand Māori Rugby Board, two NPC unions, a Heartland union. So ask the question, yes, JK. The Pacifica Advisory Group and the Super Rugby Clubs as well. Now, this is the one that the uh, NZRPA have decided they're not going to part of. So there's going to be six members now, right? So what do they do next? They establish an independent appointments and remuneration panel. So what's their job to do? Well, their job is to find the New Zealand board, which is, remember, nine people on that board of which are independent. Uh, wait, stay with it. So, so they're independent. They're independent, okay? Of which three of those have to have experience on a provincial union board. And that was the big sticking point, right? Yeah. That was the biggest part of it, all right? So then what happens is, so what they are doing, they then, uh, this <laughs> appointments board, right? <laughs> that, no, no, breathe. What they then do is they get a recruitment company to reduce the number of applications to come in. So that's not on there. That's what happens. They get a recruitment company. Now remember, this is off the New Zealand Rugby um, website. They get a recruitment company to get the numbers down for this appointments panel to decide who they're going to recommend to be on the New Zealand board. And then the voting members ratify that board appointment. So ultimately, what we've got here is we've got... Nine on a New Zealand rugby board. We've got nine on a New Zealand rugby commercial board. We've got six on a governance advisory panel going to another six that will be on the appointments panel, which will get a recruitment company to decide who the people are. There is a process here which is astounding. Now, what remains in place? Both the governance advisory panel and the appointments panel stay in place going forward, and they will actually have the governance appointment panel. I know this is tough, all right? They will actually provide this, the board this appoint advisory panel that's been established, which has representatives of provincial unions and from the Heartland unions and from Super Rugby. They will be advising... The panel. And, no, the pa the panel. Oh, no, no, no. They'll be advising New Zealand Rugby going the board going, going forward, forward okay. in terms of, I suppose, the strategic thinking and what New Zealand Rugby are doing. I, um, I can't fathom the number of people that are going to be involved in the decision-making of New Zealand Rugby going forward. That's what you're talking about here. Were you speaking English then, man? Because you lost me really quickly. How confusing is that? So that's the problem, right? So this is my problem. My problem is the Pickington report cost um, close to a million dollars. And this is the problem with the current governance. So they agreed... How much? They, How much it cost? Close to a million bucks. I'll tell you what, mate. I'll, I'll do the next review. I'll call it the Moliena review because <laughs> David Pilk, he's the man. He's awesome. But I'm going to give you a discount because... And I'll make it 1.5 million, down from 1.7. Because I'll 100% will go with you if you don't take on or adopt <laughs> my, my recommendations, mate. So yeah, 1.5 million to do a Moliena report next year. I'd pay I for that. A breakdown report. But, yeah, 
Oh, hang on. This is, so this is my problem. The problem is that we did the Pilkering report, cost near a million dollars, but this current group of people that just voted against agreed to do it. So they agreed to do it. Why? Because they knew that they had veto it in the end. Oh, we, you go and do your report, people. Yeah. Right? And then they've ignored it. So he, here's who came out in favour of this. Richie McCaw, the great Ian Kirkpatrick, Sir Michael Jones, Sir Wayne Smith, Sir Steve Hansen, Sir Buck Shelford, Mills, over 100 test matches, Goldie, 100 million test matches, uh, Sean Fitzpatrick, one of our greatest all-black captains, all came out and said, we think the game is best to do option one. And you know what these people have done? Bah! I can't do the finger here. <laughs> Translated means I'm just going to ignore that and, and get back to the, the same old stuff. The question you have stuff. to ask is why. Why have they chosen to ignore that? Why did they? What, we, yeah, it's, well, it's broken. That's the question here, right? I mean, yeah. The question is why. Because they, they, I honestly felt that they didn't think that going forward, if they went down proposal one, that they would get the respect and support that they deserve. Yeah. And that comes back to whoever's delivering the message to them about them, what they would be look, looked after going forward. Can I ask the single biggest question here? Will New Zealand Rugby Players Association follow through with the threat to go at it alone and start their own competition? JK. Yes, I think what's happened is that the people who have made this decision not to reset our game have put it in very, very big risk to have a massive split in the game between professional and oh, amateur. I, I think Proposal 1 was actually... And this is where you get muddled, because Proposal 1, from a professionalism, professional game, they want to enhance the, lower, the, 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 the grassroots and everything else. That's why they went with Proposal 1. Proposal 2 doesn't achieve that. Would it be a bad idea then if the professional game went off on their own, New Zealand Rugby, New Zealand Play Association, and the commercial side and went off their own? They could possibly do that because that's where they're funding. But I'll go back to your point, right? It's broken. The relationship between all this is absolutely broken. We're going to keep talking about this, aren't we? Because this debate uh, and this conversation is still not over. We will see you next week after the quarterfinals. Thank you for Hollanders. joining us. Go the Hollanders. Try by Corey Toole. Happy life.